Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is a singer-songwriter who burst onto the music scene in 1977 with his irresistible hit single, Ariel. She was a Jewish girl. I fell in love with her. She wrote a number on the back of my hand. I called her up. I was all out of breath. I said, come hear me play in the rock and roll band. Took a shower and I put on my best blue jeans. I picked her up in my new VW van. She wore a peasant blouse with nothing underneath. I said hi. She said, Yeah, I guess I am. Since then, he's had numerous hit singles, including Woman of Mine. Lucky stars. What are you crazy? How in the hell can you stay when you just said? I was talking to myself, shut the door. to say your endearing mother called today did you see lisa yes i saw lisa is that why you're angry i wasn't angry maybe a little not even maybe must be the weather now don't be a baby Lydia. Lydia keeps my toothbrush in her apartment And she never complains Well, hardly ever And then jokingly she says Boy, it's been so long since I've held you I nearly gave you up for dead I nearly gave you up for dead I nearly gave you up for dead Lydia, Lydia, how come you understand? I can offer you nothing at all This is more than I had planned Rocking chair And McDonald's girl. I am in love with the McDonald's girl. She has a smile of innocence, so tender and warm. I am in love with the McDonald's girl. She is an angel in a polyester uniform. I leave from softball practice every night. It's getting dark, but the golden arches light up the way. I turn the corner at the traffic light. I got my money and then I rehearse what I'm going to say. I'd like an order of fries, a quarter pounder with cheese. I love the light in your eyes. Will you go out with me, please? I am in love with the McDonald's girl. 
He's recorded 19 terrific albums, including Well, Well, Said the Rocking Chair, The Treehouse Journals, Submarine Races, Squirrels in the Attic, Words and Music, 12 Songs, and one of my personal favorites, Dean Friedman in Concert, Shepherd's Bush Empire. His latest album entitled American Lullaby is a collection of deeply moving and thought-provoking songs reflecting our guests' personal reflections and philosophies about the current state of America. His songs fearlessly touch on a broad range of topics, including the pandemic, the environment, racism, sexism, and of course, the calamity surrounding American politics. His songs have been covered by bands including the Bare Naked Ladies, Ben Folds Five, Ariel Pink, the Tone Rangers, and the Blenders. He's written, performed, and produced the theme music to several TV series, including Boone, Nick Arcade, and Erie, Indiana. He also composed, performed, and produced the soundtrack to the 1990 cult horror film, I Bought a Vampire Motorcycle, in which he performs the popular track, She Runs on Blood, Not Gasoline. My baby wears leather and chrome. To leave the machine She runs on blood Instead of gasoline And if that weren't enough This exceptionally multi-talented man Wrote a groundbreaking book on synthesizers As well as a guide to songwriting And a hilarious book entitled A Musician's Guide to Surviving the Great Recession and he's even dabbled in the world of video games. I'm delighted to welcome Dean Friedman to our show. Dean, thank you so much for being here. Hey, Harvey, thanks for having me. Dean, you started writing songs when you were a kid, and by the time you were 20, you had a manager and a recording contract, which is amazing. Who were your musicians and songwriters that inspired you when you were growing up? Well, I my mom was a singer and performed uh, in film and on Broadway. And so there's a, there was always some Broadway show tune on the piano or some aria playing on the record player. I grew up in a house filled with music. Uh, and so my influences were pretty eclectic, you know, running the gamut from all the great Broadway writers to classical and as soon as I got a transistor radio. I started listening to all the top 40 and and sort of absorbed everything. The Beatles, Dylan, the Stones, the Supremes, Stevie Wonder. And I, you know, I just always knew that music was going to be a part of my life. Uh, then once I, I got a few bucks to play a coffee house, I thought, well, this is a pretty sweet, getting paid to do something I, I love to do anyway. And uh, I've been doing it ever since. You know, I've had a lot of guests on my show talk about the impact of becoming famous early in life. And most of them say that it was really tough and nowhere near as glamorous as the public thinks. Looking back, how do you think you handled your fame? <laughs> well, you know what, Harvey? It never seemed as if I actually ever became famous. I had a brief uh, run of singles here in the States and, and then in the UK. But as exciting as all that was, I, I was acutely aware that, that, that in, in terms of business, the, the people that were involved in my career just kept making these ridiculous boneheaded mistakes. And so I, I guess, you know, I had the, the, the briefest exposure to what you might think of as fame, but in, in terms of how I grappled with it, it's more a question of how I grappled with surviving being ejected from the music business <laughs> after that very brief period of time. You know, I never really got to hang out with the folks that I considered my musical peers. And I, I spent such a very short time on the road that it was only after I was dropped from my labels that I managed to consciously sort of pursue the music business as an independent. And, and that was a sort of a long painstaking process that uh, is still ongoing, but in many ways more fulfilling, you know, productive financially, because I, I made more money selling 
a thousand albums that were crowdfunded independently than I did selling a million singles in the traditional music system business. Isn't that really telling that these people that we all think are so gifted and such great business people, and they really understand what the public wants and the public likes, they do often make a whole lot of mistakes. And in the process, they can ruin somebody's career. It's, it, <laughs> you know, what? it's, it's a business, it's a life. And it's hard, it's hard for me to characterize it all. You know, some folks had good intentions, but they were kind of short-sighted in terms of what it takes to cultivate a, a brand new young artist. For example, when I started working with my management company, The Bottom Line, because they owned what at the time was the premier showcase uh, for music in, in New York City and employed you know, dozens and dozens of, of personnel to run their club, they never thought of what, working with me as a partnership. Uh, they thought that I worked for them. And I, I just never really saw it that way. And same with the record label. Th there was never any kind of mutual respect. Uh, and no matter how hard I worked to please them and to do my job, I kept, you know, delivering them hit singles one after the other. But because essentially they didn't really have respect for the, for the artists, their idea was, well, go sit in the corner, write songs. We'll worry about the money. And that's what happened. <laughs> they I about can't the money. tell you how many music artists I've had on the show, including ones who've been mega stars, who've said exactly the same thing about their record labels. Now, I want to mention a couple of your albums. I mentioned some in my introduction. I want to ask you about the Words and Music album which is an incredible two disc compilation album with 30 songs. And I like to give it to people who may not be as familiar with your music as I think they should be. I'm wondering why you didn't include Lucky Stars, Lydia or Ariel in that compilation. A, a couple of reasons. First of all, I still don't have the rights to the first album, which Ariel is on. Uh, although that reverts back to me in 2033, according to the, the, the good graces of the uh, Copyright Reversion Act. So uh, although the second album has reverted back to me and I included Rocking Chair on, on that compilation album, I did feel like Lucky Stars ha had already ha had its fair share of exposure, almost a ubiquitous, ubiquitous amount when it first came out, which may have led to some backlash. And I felt that there were so many songs that had been neglected as a result. And so I wanted to give them uh, an opportunity to be heard. So uh, uh, th that's the answer. Well, I want to suggest to our viewers, if you're not familiar with Dean Friedman's music, and you should be, start with the Words and Music album. It's an incredible compilation of some of his very, very best material. Now, everyone knows that your song, McDonald's Girl, was officially banned by the BBC in 1982 because it mentioned the name of McDonald's, the fast food chain. And then 30 <laughs> years later, in 2011, the McDonald's Corporation used your song in a national TV and radio campaign performed by the Blenders. Why didn't they use your version of the song? Uh, I'm not sure, but I, I, I was always delighted to hear the Blenders version of it. Uh, you know, people ask, you know, what, what are your thoughts about different cover versions? Anytime I hear a different interpretation of my song, it's it's great fun. And, and the Blenders in particular did a great job. Uh, and, and it made sense in the context that they used it for the McDonald's commercial. So look, uh, you know, even though it took 33 years for them to finally come around to realizing that, that this song was going to do the job for them, I, uh, I I was pleased that that song finally sort of demonstrated what it was capable of. It was a little song that could. It insisted on being heard, even though it was banned ridiculously. And the BBC were, was convinced immediately upon hearing the song, millions of people would rush out to buy a hamburger. Uh, even though I argued that in the lyric, I never actually eat the hamburger. I thought it could be more of a public service announcement, but they didn't see it that way. 
Well, as um, you know, McDonald's Girl has also been recorded by the Bare Naked Ladies, and it's gone viral on YouTube. There are at least 40 different versions of the song on YouTube. How does it feel to see your music making an impact on a new generation of artists? It's gratifying, especially if you're writing so-called popular songs. Part of that suggests that people are going to listen to it and like it. Although that's not necessarily my first audience. I write songs and originally to to please my own sense of, of what a song should sound like. If other people like it, that's great. That's a bonus. And in music business, which always seems so transient and so ready to listen to the next new thing, it's very gratifying to, to have a sense of longevity. Uh, and the, the music that I write ha continues to have re re relevance for, for, as you say, another generation and beyond. Yeah, um, I love that. So yeah, it just to me, it it's it speaks to the integrity of those songs, for sure. Now you did something in two thousand and two, Dean, that was virtually unheard of at that time. You got your fans to finance the Treehouse Journals album by selling copies in advance, and then you did it again in two thousand and five with Squirrels in the Attic, and again in two thousand and seventeen with Twelve Songs. Now, of course, many music artists use crowdfunding to finance their work, but you were one of the very first. What gave you the idea to do it? Well, you know what? I was sitting in my treehouse. I had written a bunch of songs, and I, I, I didn't have the money to, to produce a whole new record. I, I needed to upgrade my studio, and, and it's kind of nice to actually pay musicians as well. And I didn't want to have to wait another 20 years for some record label to give me permission to be a recording artist. So I wrote a, an email to folks who had visited my website. And I said, look, I'm ready to record an album. If you order it in advance, that'll give me the funding to, to deliver it and produce it. And I'll try to get it to you within a year. Uh, I was a little worried that most people would say, uh, you know, oh, oh uh, Dean, why don't you get a proper job <laughs> and work like everybody else? And some people actually did say exa exactly that. But most people said, all right, that's a good idea. And they, and they uh, supported the idea. So I was able to raise the money by advanced orders to, to uh, upgrade the studio, pay musicians, and uh, deliver a new album. Uh, the band Marillion had done it a year before uh, to finance their U.S. tour. But it was early on in the days of the Internet. And as far as I know, I was the first uh, solo artist uh, to crowdfund on the Internet uh, to, to make a, a new album. And I've been doing it ever since. You are a visionary. And while we're at it, I can't resist asking you about your album, A Million Matzo Balls, which in my opinion is a must have for every Jewish home. My mama loves to cook at least three times a day. But every now and then she gets carried away. Let me tell you all the time that I recall. One day my mama made a million matzo balls. A million My personal favorite is, oh my gosh, it's a Hamantosh. Where did you get the idea to do that album? Well, you know, when, when you have kids and you're a songwriter, inevitably you're going to start writing silly songs. <laughs> and that was the case. And I wrote a whole bunch of silly songs. My kids were little and I was invited to substitute for uh, one of the teachers at the local Hebrew school. And I started by teaching them a lot of the traditional you know hebrew school songs and i thought i'd throw in a, a few of my own so i wrote a, a, whole, a whole slew of silly hebrew school songs like a, a million matzo balls uh and oh my gosh it's a homage <laughs> well i love it dean a lot of people may not know that you recorded a children's album called kids songs my favorite one is please 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 don't tease the bees I'd love to see you do a children's concert on video performing the songs from that album. Don't you think the parents and kids would love that? Well, you know, I did a DVD many years ago and I might uh, re-release it to, to address that very question. It, it, it's always a lot of fun. Again, when you have little kids and you're a songwriter, inevitably you're gonna write a bunch of silly songs, which is what I did. And I did some demos of it and uh, wound up passing them around and people kept asking them for more. So. I finally put them on my website. And I, I, I have done a number of silly song concerts. 
with a lot of props and costumes and uh, the kids always have uh, have a fun time you know the thing about a children's audience is is that on the one hand are very demanding they, they really require your full attention uh, you, you need to maintain focus but at the same time they have no preconceptions so they're ready to be entertained so it, it, it's actually much more exhausting to do a, a kids concert than a regular grown-up concert uh, because uh, you, you can barely uh, take a breath uh, but having said that they are the most appreciative audience when you're doing your job right now of course no interview with dean friedman would be complete without asking you about half man half biscuit and their song the bastard son of dean friedman how in the world could they have suggested that you're the father of nigel blackwell when according to my math, you were only seven years old when he was born. Uh, it is a puzzle. Now, I have to say I was a precocious child, Harvey, <laughs> but uh, not that precocious. And uh, <laughs> thank heavens for your parents' sake. Yeah, uh, uh, but I did when I listened to the record, I just thought it was hilarious. I gotta say, Nigel Blackwell is a terrific songwriter uh, and Half Men, Half Biscuit are a kicking band. Uh, but even then, I swore that one day I would exact my revenge. And I finally did uh, when I wrote A Baker's Tale, which tells the true story uh, of the uh, dubious origins of one Nigel Blackwell. I loved it. Now, Dean, in 2012, you published a really entertaining book entitled A Musician's Guide to Surviving the Great Recession, Practical Tips for Living a Truly Better Life in a Precarious Economy. You finally confirmed my suspicion, I have to tell you this, that yeah. musicians have much more sex than the rest of us, but you published the book anonymously. Why? Well, because I also gave some tips that might just skate the edge of legality. <laughs> uh, for example, I explained uh, the benefits of my dog getting his own credit card, which is a true story. First, he signed up for one of the Columbia Record Clubs, paid his bills on time, and eventually uh, got a letter in the mailbox offering him a credit card. And uh, with some trepidation, uh, I signed his name, you know, his paws. And he got a credit card. And uh, for a while there, uh, again, by virtue of my being a professional musician, my dog Barker had much better credit than I ever did. Well, I love that book. Okay, Dean, let's talk about your most recent album, American Lullaby, which contains probably the most profound lyrics you've ever written, in my opinion. It's about the serious state of turmoil and disarray that we're living through right now. And you cover some very important subjects, referring to the mass murder in Las Vegas, the West Coast forest fires, the pandemic, America's love affair with guns, and of course, the crazy American politics. But I've heard you say that you don't consider this a doom and gloom album. Do you feel any optimism for the future? Well, Harvey, I, by nature, I, I'm optimistic, although you might call it an irrational optimism. The album is really just my personal reaction to all the crazy stuff that's happened over these past few years. Uh, you know, not just to me, but to everyone here in the States and around the world. It might have started about over six years ago when I woke up along with my countrymen and women to discover that a bankrupt real estate developer from New York and known money launderer for the Russian mafia had become president of the United States. And there's no way to overstate how mind boggling that was. Especially well, just imagine what the rest of the world was thinking, like those of us up here in Canada. Uh, exactly. Because clearly uh, it was something that had ramifications for every country around the world. And far into the future, which is now our present. <laughs> and at the same time, you asked if I was optimistic. And I am. Uh, and I, I was conscious that I was dealing with a lot of difficult topics. So I did strive to balance the record. Uh, with songs that did celebrate life and 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 had hope for the future. And well, I'm glad to hear you say that because my favorite songs on the album are I Wish You Joy and On a Summer's Night because they're such feel-good songs and they're a nice contrast to the intensity of the themes in the other songs. So thank you for including those songs in the album. I I'm pleased to hear you say that. And 
you know, you, you mentioned the uh, Summer's Night, the very last song. And in my mind, it was sort of a, a chance to catch your breath that even though we were going through or have gone through difficult times, you know, at this moment, in this time, we can ha have joy with just sitting in a peaceful setting, however briefly, and listen to the crickets and the frogs chirping or croaking. <laughs> Uh, it's also the reason I, I included one of my favorite tracks on the album, which is uh, just another birthday song. Uh, because, you know, the original birthday song was written 125 years ago by the Hill Sisters, two kindergarten teachers who were trying to get their kids to shut up. Uh, I thought it was time for an update. Uh, and I also felt that even during uh, difficult times, it's incumbent upon us to celebrate things that need to be celebrated and to find joy and happiness where we can. So it's a very silly song, but I, I think it makes an important point. And trying to put all these al these topics together in the album, I was concerned along the lines of what the question you raised, that it might be perceived as full of doom and gloom because I was dealing with difficult topics. But I came upon a framework that really helped me conceive of the songs and put the album together, and that's the idea of a lullaby. Because if you think about it, Harvey, lullabies in every culture around the world, they, they share something very curious in common, which is that if you picture, you know, a parent rocking their baby to sleep in their arms, singing a, a sweet melody and gentle, soothing tones. If, if you listen to the lyrics of most lullabies, they're terrifying. You know, rock by baby on the treetop, when the wind blows, the cradle rock. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. Bow will come, baby. Cradle and all. Well, first of all, what the hell is the kid doing up in the tree? And second of all, how is this any way to put a child to sleep? Uh, and this puzzled me until it, it dawned on me that this is, it must be a universal yearning on the part of parents everywhere to instill critical information, life changing, life saving information into the minds of the next generation without scaring the hell out of them. And so I, I adopted that framework as a way to approach American lullaby in terms of weaving th these stories together, uh, including in particular the title track, American Lullaby, which tells a, a, you know, a difficult tale of 400 years of American violence uh, abetted by our inexplicable love affair with guns. But I tried to do it in the context of a lullaby so that people were better able to receive it and kind of grasp the tale that's being told even though it talks about American violence uh, and our original sins, the massacre of the indigenous population and slavery, again, both abetted by our love affair with guns. I, I love my country. I love, I'm proud to be an American and I'm proud of those virtues uh, that America aspires to, but doesn't always reach. Uh, but if you're not honest with your history, if you're not truthful with yourself about your past, then you are just doomed to make those same mistakes over and over again. And we do have a longing to get better. Uh, so that's how the album came about. Well, the wonderful thing about your album, I mean, the melodies are very enjoyable, but this is the kind of album that I like to get my friends together and really listen to the lyrics. I read that your song, The Russians Are Coming, is inspired by the Senate Intelligence Committee report on Russian involvement in the 2016 U.S. election. Is that right? Every word of it is taken... Uh, out of that 1,000 page bipartisan Senate committee report and documents the hundreds of communications between Trump's campaign committee and the Russian secret services. <laughs> and and it, it's clear every day that comes out the, the hundreds of millions of dollars that Russia was spending on uh, campaign interference in elections, not just in America, but around the world, uh, including Brexit, and, you know, Nigel Farage and all those good folks who have uh, done so much damage to Western democracies by polluting the discourse. And so The Russians Are Coming is my uh, humorous attempt to tell a painful story of how America wound up with a con artist for a president who recommended that we drink bleach uh, or shine a flashlight up our ass to cure COVID 
causing even more hundreds of, of thousands of people to die unnecessarily by following his ridiculous advice. Your song, Riding with Biden, speaks for itself, and I absolutely love it. What's the reaction you're getting to that song from your fans? Well, look, it's obviously partisan, and it obviously it inevitably has a partisan reaction. So MAGA supporters uh, <laughs> despise it and are constantly trolling the YouTube page. But anyone with an ounce of common sense realizes that whatever his faults, for whatever his faults, uh, Biden rescued us from another four years of Trump and has been doing really positive, productive things uh, and, and are still very polarized government, which we should be grateful for. Amen to that. Now, Dean, you've been very busy recently touring in the United Kingdom and Ireland, where you're absolutely adored, and you'll be appearing in concert in New York on October the 8th. And then what's next for Dean Friedman? Well, I do have some plans to revisit the Zooming that I did, you know, as soon as the lockdown happened. I, along with so many fellow musicians, fired up my computer, got a camera, and started doing Dean Zine live streams, a Zoom concert. And I plan on revisiting that. You know, and I'm sure you've had this reaction from people. Uh, I, I originally approached doing a Zoom music concert with some skepticism. Uh, it, it seemed like it could be, you know, the remoteness uh, could lack intimacy. But I found that the opposite was true, that to perform for a Zoom audience, something really curious happens is that, first of all, you can see everybody in their own habitat. You can see folks in their bedrooms, in their living rooms, uh, with their pets hopping up and down on their laps, snacking and let's see what they're drinking. You can see their family wandering in and out of the frame. So there is this weird intimacy in a Zoom concert, which I really grew to appreciate. And I think the audience has appreciated it as well, because because it also fosters a community sense, because not only can I see everybody in the audience, everybody can see everybody in the audience. So folks become familiar with, you know, regular visitors, and it, it does foster the sense of community, which I look forward to continuing uh, once I fire up my studio again. Yeah, I love the fact that you make your music so accessible. I want to tell our viewers that you can follow Dean Friedman's career and order his music, books, and other merchandise, and you can see his touring schedule all by going to his website, deanfriedman.com, which is now appearing on your screen. Well, Dean, it's been really great having this chance to chat with you. I've been a big fan of yours from the beginning. I really appreciate you taking the time to appear on our show. Thank you so much. Harvey, thanks for having me. And my best wishes to all your viewers. And hope to see some of you folks at the upcoming gig uh, at Chelsea uh, Table and Stage, uh, October 8th, Saturday night. And tickets are available through my website. Uh, and I'll also be touring again in the UK 2023. And some of those dates are already uh, for, up on sale on my website, deanfriedman.com. Harvey, it's been a pleasure. I look forward to seeing you again next time. Me too. Our guest has been the brilliant singer, songwriter, and author, Dean Friedman. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver, and to Steve Osborne, Darren Jay, and our entire team in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.